gracias a todos. Vamos a empezar la tercera sesión de estas jornadas de arqueología. La primera ponencia la hará la profesora Claudia Toinefog y ella es profesora de la Universidad de Viena. Es también jefa del Departamento de Arqueología de Prehistoria y, y Medieval y directora del Programa de Doctorado de Estudios Históricos y Culturales. Dentro de sus amplias líneas de, de estudio, de recerca, ella se ha dedicado tanto a arqueología medieval como en los últimos años en campos de concentración nazi. Por un lado, ha, ha trabajado el, el campo de concentración de Sachsenhausen y por el otro, Mauthausen, uno de los campos de concentraciones más conocidos justamente aquí en España por el volumen de españoles, de, de prisioneros españoles que tuvo este campo. Empezamos con ella. Nosotros nos apartamos para poder ver el PowerPoint. Sorry. First, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me to Barcelona. It's a pleasure to be here and to discuss such important questions about crime and genocide with you. For eight, <coughs> for eight years, I've been working on contemporary archaeology. When I was still located at the Humboldt University in Berlin, I started a project in the former concentration camp of Sachsenhausen, north of Berlin. Since two 2007, I've been working at the University of Vienna, where I'm involved in the interdisciplinary study of the concentration camp Mauthausen and its subcamps as head of the archaeological investigations. <coughs> My motivation and interest um, in investigating such uh, sites differing from my other archaeological projects concerning medieval times, my motivation is based on remembering the crimes and the victims. Concentration camps are crime scenes where a terrorist dictatorship with racist ideology degraded people to inferior being. They were forced to slave labor, they were tortured and murdered. <coughs> the crime scenes can serve as memorials for victims, they can warn us, and admonish us and help to teach young people about national socialism, especially when they lack a direct connection to the spirit by our parents or grandparents. Through our research, we can offer materials and objects to the memorials and museums which help them to create places of learning and remembrance. So in my lecture, I will focus on archaeological investigations in concentration camps. First, I will talk about aspects of remembrance and learning. Then I will present some case studies in detail. I will shortly talk about the investigations in the Polish extermination camps, more detailed about my research in the concentration camps in Mauthausen and Sachsenhausen and some other sites you can see on this map. And I want to talk about the finds as material culture and their special meaning. It has become common sense that approaches towards the past should incorporate all available sources, written documents of various kinds, oral tradition, images, drawings, as well as photos, and material culture. Each source embodies a specific, partly differing, and amending potential and possesses its unique cultural meaning and significance. As archaeologists, we have to use mo modern methods to study such large and significant places connected with the recent past. These investigations involve surveying huge areas of several hectares. The first step in our investigation is always to look at maps and aerial photographs to get a first impression of the area. Then we consequently use geographic, <coughs> uh, geophysical uh, prospection and digital terrain models together. You can see this here. And uh, to gather information about the structures beneath the modern surface and make them visible. With both methods, we can see, for example, barracks, as you can see here, um, and other structures of the camps. <coughs> Particularly in the large former concentration camps in Germany and Poland, 
Archaeological investigations have been conducted since the late um, 80s, but also in some smaller subcamps. Since 2000, also the camps in Austria have been investigated. But there are also uh, numerous concentration camps or subcamps, prisoner camps or prisoner of war camps in the Netherlands, Belgium, France, on the occupied Channel Island, in Denmark and Norway. Some of the recently started ex uh, examinations in these regions are, uh, for example, excavations in Westerbork or some research on the island of Alderney. The reasons for the archaeological excavations in these camps differ. On the one hand, any building measuring in former concentration camps in Germany and Austria are in principle accompanied by archaeological investigations. On the other hand, there are a number of former concentration camps which are demolished after World War II, overbuilt or forgotten by the public. <coughs> some, so some initiatives aim to recall these places into the collective memory. Mostly there are memorials at the main camps like Sachsenhausen, Flossenbürg, Dachau and so on. But most of the subcamps are forgotten places. In these cases, at least a map of a remaining relicts can be compiled, a small memorial with a memorial stone and information boards can be installed. Sites such like the concentration camps in Germany or the buildings of the Gestapo which is known as Topography of Terror in Berlin, were banned from Germany's cultural memory for a long time. They have become traumatized places or memorials against will. After the 1980s discussions that strongly demanded a de deliberate commemoration of the victims of National Socialism, these places became centrally rooted memorials. For countries like Poland, which has to be thought as one of the main victims of National Socialism and the Second World War, it is easier to consider these places as identity establishing uh, places also in the sense of lieu de mémoire after Pierre Noir. The same might be true for other countries. Further, it has to be noted, noted that since the 1990s, archaeological activities has been a part of an uh, active part of political education in Europe. For instance, young people are taught about the terror strategies by sending them to so-called youth um, work camps in German or Polish memorials. The organizers think that working with young people directly in the former concentration camps might have a stronger effect uh, on them than a simple lecture or a small, uh, short guided tour in the memorial. These work camps also have to be understood as a response to the constantly decreasing number of survivors who can talk about the camp life and the terror. Now I will discuss the case studies. Beside Auschwitz, there was nearly no other memorial in Poland. The knowledge of the extermination camps was rather low because of the great lack of written sources of contemporary witnesses. So the main interest often lay in the renewal or extension of a memorial site to show clearly the structures of the camp. This is especially true for the death camp in Poland as mentioned above. A first comprehensive archaeological investigation was carried out by Andrzej Kola from the University of Turun in Beijing. Core drillings in the entire area of the camp helped to trace the structures <coughs> still preserved in the ground. It was possible to locate the remains of the buildings and the mass graves. You can see here the mass graves and one of the uh, maps uh, drawn by a survivor. <coughs> During its period of usage, the camp was modified once. For instance, the place, where the, gas the, the place of the gas chamber changed. In the first phase, the building was situated in the center, while in the second er um, phase, it was situated here in the north. 
In the beginning, the murdered people were disposed in mass graves. Cremation started later. Further excavations were carried out in other camps like Sobibor and Chelmo. Archaeological uh, excavation also have begun now in Auschwitz. We can see, um, we can visit now the new memorials at this site, for example in Belzec, and that offer us possibilities for remembrance. One of the forgotten places in Germany was the camp of Witten Annen, a subcamp of Buchenwald. Back in 1988, the city of Witten asked the Office for Preservation to carry out excavations in the area of the camp following a discovery of pupils from Witten who had noticed the name of their hometown on a memorial plaque of subcamps during a visit at the Buchenwald Memorial. This event induced an, an increasing interest in this forgotten place. The aim was to verify the camp existence and to uncover its remains to study the conditions of life. In 1945, the camp was cleared and uh, soon after, all the buildings were torn down to the foundation and a residential and commercial area were built. Only a small area remained unde undeveloped. The foundations of some barracks as well as the concrete pillars, as you can see here from the camp fence, were still visible. During the archaeological investigations, the other sources um, in the archives were compared to the still visible foundations. This task was followed <coughs> by an investigation of uh, the different room functions. Today, a memorial stone and a fence mark the former concentration camp. The subcamp of Gunzkirchen in Upper Austria was also a forgotten place. This subcamp existed only for six weeks in March, April, and May 45. During the so-called death marches, of the war in the winter 44 and 45, Jewish Hungarian prisoners were forced to leave the areas near the Eastern Front and were driven west. The information about, uh, available for the camp are very thin. At the location itself, there's only a small memorial stone, but there's an aerial photography from uh, spring 45 and a digital terrain map where you can see here the traces of the barracks and a map from a survivor that we used as a starting point for a survey. We recovered several artifacts, most of them with Hungarian inscriptions. By now we have a plan, as you can see, a lot of material culture and we can tell a part of the story. Similar investigations have been carried out in the former concentration camps, other uh, concentration camps as well. Here, too, an interest of a renewal or extension of a memorial site was the main reason to uncover unknown structures of the camp, for example, at the Leubel Pass at the border um, from Austria to Slovenia, Moreover, the wish to examine localities with high symbolic value for gathering more information led to specific investigations, for instance, the, death, uh, the ramp of death in Flossenbürg. Very successful was <coughs> the integration of a rescue excavation into a concept of a memorial exhibition in the Hartheim Manger in Upper Austria. The mansion was used by the Nazis as an euthanasia institution between 1940 and 44. In this case, the building was massively rebuilt after the war. Therefore, the question arose, arose which parts of the building were still the same as in the Nazi period. Important finds of the victims and a lot of cremated human remains were found during an archaeological investigation <coughs> of a trench. In a pit, the personal belongings of the murdered people were found and the whole feature was dug, on block, um, dug up on block and placed in the memorial. 
This is a picture of uh, Hebertshausen, um, where is a shooting facility <coughs> for the concentration camp of uh, Dachau. The excavations in Herbertshausen Dachau in 2001 show clearly the violence and death in concentration camps. As in other concentration camps, Soviet prisoners of war were killed in Dachau in the winter of 41-42 in the framework of mass shootings. The complex is characterized by two walls. The border is a wooden wall and a bullet trap. The remains of the wooden ball could be recorded during the archaeological excavations. You see that here. As well as traces of the posts to which the prisoner had to be tied up. Furthermore, an iron fetter found next to the post verifies this practice, as well as numbers of bone fragments, mainly from skulls. The forensic analysis showed that the prisoners were shot at a close range by several riflemen and not, as mentioned in the rip, uh, written reports, from a distance about 20 meters. In this case, violence and death could be detected by archaeological and anthropological means. The inside archives by these investigations clearly exceed the information given by other sources. My research in Mauthausen is related to a new concept of the memorial. Again, it was necessary to revise the <coughs> exhibition. Heretofore, visitors could only see the main camp built in uh, 1938 and not <coughs> the large outside sections. The prisoners had to break granite stones here uh, in the quarry for building in Linz, Vienna, and other locations. Soon after the liberation in May 45, many areas of the camps and the barracks were torn down. In 47, the camp was handed over to the state of Austria with an obligation to build a memorial there. At that time, only the central areas and the parade ground, as you can see here, this is a parrot ground and this as well, uh, were considered worth for being preserved, whereas other outside areas were regarded as not historically relevant. Therefore, most of the outside areas were transformed rather into a park landscape. This is an aerial photo from spring 45. You can clearly see the large outside sections. Part of the new concept is to make these outside sections visible again. First, archaeologists carried out a comprehensive geophysical survey in this area. Here you see uh, an aerial photo and the geophysical map of the so-called hospital camp in this area. And here we made the first um, excavation in uh, 2009. <coughs> and uh, we excavated the head of Barrack 6. The foundations were found directly beneath the modern surface. The foundation is built of large stones and has a brick base. Inside the barrack was divided in three parts. The postmarks were clearly visible. One part, two, and here's the third part. Also, the footprint of a furnace was detected. The entrance was paved carefully here. <coughs> Among the finds, there were a lot of objects that belonged to the barracks, such as nails and door fittings. Although some personal items, such as dish belongings of the soldiers, were found here. The dish, respectively, the mess kit, dated from the time of World War I, so probably one prisoner used that old mess kit. This is an aerial photograph and one of the very few other photographs um, here of the tent camp and the geophysical map. The traces of the post can be seen clearly. Uh, the inside of the tent show no abnormalities. 
The few eyewitnesses report that exist from the tent camp describe it as probably the most horrific part of the camp. It was built in late 44 for concentrating prisoners driven to Mauthausen from the east. When they arrived in Mauthausen, they were not even resisted. The tent provided for the prisoners were taken from a brewery in Linz and consisted only of roof pieces, but, not, uh, but did not have any side covers. The water supply consisted of small trenches running parallel the tent. During a four-week campaign, we excavated uh, the sections cutting across uh, uh, the second large tent from the south. The tents were originally erected on artificial built terraces. On the south side, we recorded a trench here, most likely be uh, belonging to the water supplying system. The stratigraphy shows clearly that the trench was repeatedly blocked by mud and water coming from the higher terrace in the south. The constant flow of mud and dirt surely led to further contamination of probably already unclean drinking water. Um, yeah. Huge accumulations layers from mud and the um, original walking level of the tent show that the inner parts of the tent were constantly swept and flowed during rain. There was no pavement or solid flooring in the tents, meaning that prisoners were forced to stand, to sit or sleep on the naked floor and being totally exposed to water and mud penetrating the tent from the sides. We could recover a mount, uh, amount of objects from the uh, trench which, which were lost by the prisoners. <coughs> There were uh, two British shoes, objects with Hungarian uh, inscriptions. Uh, you can see here a mirror and a, a shoe, uh, and even a necklace. These objects show that the prisoners tried to keep some of their personal belongings to stay connected with the former lives and, uh, and habits even in this horrible environment. In the lower part of the section, we discovered several wooden panels, as you can see here. Uh, the panels were struck vertically in the ground, and we believe that they may have served as prov uh, provisory space separation inside the tent, probably put up by the prisoners themselves. It is stated by one of the eyewitness that prisoners tried to separate several ill people from the others. Possibly these panels refer to such attempts. A questions for the archaeologists coming from the historians deal with the so-called ash heap. The investigations aim to find out how much ash and cremated remains has been placed here. Therefore, we drilled holes. The drill calls were documented and the finds separated. After that, the cores were immediately put back into the ground again. The documentation of the sample show that the concentration of the ash in the back was much bigger than in the front. Of the it was bigger in this part than here. The area had already been leveled by the Nazis for the disposal of the ash. The different layers of ashes were divided by further leveling horizons. The drill call also con a number of finds, such as personal belongings of the prisoners. Other questions concerning, for example, the still existing way to the quarry. It was not clear if it was dated in the Nazi area or if it was uh, covered by a younger space. The excavation showed that there was just a simple way, way with low stones, but the Nazis built a new way with a deeper foundation. An important aspect of the research in Mauthausen is the investigation of building structures. All the buildings still standing are currently examined in the framework of a large building archaeological survey. An important building was Barrack 1, as you can see here. Here, the camp clerks were housed and also the camp brothel. 
The walls and ceiling in the sex cabins were painted over with yellow color in a post-war period. It could be recorded that there were several wall paintings on the wall and on the ceiling. Through this, the brothel was vis uh, visibly embellished. Other architecture examinations took place in the killing area. Here we found the remains of a uh, shooting facility. And on the floor, you can see still see the traces of the backstop. Finally, the gas chamber itself and the small room in front of it where the apparatus to funnel the gas were installed, was installed were <coughs> examined. Different tiles are clearly visible on the wall. A photography taken shortly after the liberation shows the reparation with nine tiles and a hole in the wall where the pipe from the gas apparatus originally led into the gas chamber. Presumably, the Nazis themselves dismantled the devices and sealed the hole with nine tiles. After the Americans tried to find out about the apparatus' original position and removed the tiles again to discover, rediscover the hole, the spot was then closed with 16 tiles. Here, here you can see the nine tiles, and here are 16 tiles now. <coughs> Next, I will talk about uh, Sachsenhausen. The flagship <coughs> camp north of Berlin was built in 1936, um, while the Olympic Games took place in the capital. The triangular shape was considered as <coughs> ideal form for controlling the inside, a geometry of terror. Tower A on the south base of the camp offered an overview here of the entire half circle. The commander's office and the SS area was located in the south. In addition, there were a number of uh, extensions that had been built after 38. The camp was liberated in uh, April 45. From August 45 until uh, 1950, uh, it was a Soviet special camp. The Soviets used all faci facilities of the camp except the uh, killing area, the so-called Station Z, that is here. From 1950 to 1960, the Nationale Volksarmee took over and used the camp as a training camp and storage. Many uh, buildings became dilapidated. <coughs> In 1942 um, 43, Station Z were blown up. In 61, the GDR erected a national memorial which, is still, which was still in use until 1990. After the re reunification of Germany, the camp became a memorial and museum in 93. Uh, in this framework, the contents of the exhibition had to be revised through the aim was to keep the different levels of the time visible. The excavation covered in the area around Station Z. However, it has to be emphasized that the actual uh, exterminations areas that were built during the winter 41-42, the gas chamber, which was built in 43, the next shooting facilities and the crematoria were not directly affected by the excavations. In the framework of these uh, constructions, um, a number of cremated remains were uncovered, but not further structures uh, except the old paving um, leading to the gas chamber where we found, um, where some teeth were found. Behind the crematorium, the ash pan could, uh, could be documented. Also, the connection between the furnaces inside the building and the outside ash pan. <coughs> this is inside and this is outside, here you can see it. These facilities allowed clear, clearing the furnaces from ash and putting it directly into an ash pan. When the ash pan was full, the cremated remains were dumped into large pits. 
Photos from May 45 show huge amounts of cremations being stored in the area of Station Z. One of on the one hand, the discovery of human remains demonstrated violence and death in the concentration camps very clearly. On the other hand, we also have to be aware of Jewish religious burial customs. One of the most fundamental Jewish beliefs, the sanctity of the rest in death, requires an everlasting preservation of burials. The Jewish grave in the house of eternity must not be disturbed. This principle is, is respected as much as possible during the excavations in the former concentration camps, as we did in Mauthausen and also the Polish colleagues did in the Polish concentration camps. Therefore, cremated or skeleton remains are mostly not anthropological examined but reburied. In 2006, the finds of a large garbage pit were investigated. Um, the content of the pit could not be excavated properly. Um, mechanical uh, digger recovered the find and put them in an industrial area of the memorial. The results were 13 large mounds of dirt and finds here and a sorting machine screens the material with different strengths. The remaining soil was once more sieved uh, with even finer screens, leading to the discovery of small finds such as coins and buttons. Finally, finds of a total weight of more than 5,000 kilogram were uncovered. According to usual standards of archaeological categorization of objects, the first sort is sorted in the terms of their material. The weight of the iron added up to uh, 3,000 kilograms, bottled and other glass objects were over 800 and so on. However, it soon became clear that these categories were not suitable for an analyzing the material in regard to daily life in the camps on the relation of offenders and victims. Therefore, a functional classification were developed. The following categories, as you can see on the right, were formed construction, <coughs> clothing, toiletries, household, military, coins, and other things. And I show you now some pictures. Here we have uh, household items, and household items and personal belongings, as is glasses and pipes and so on, um, clothing. Here we have some um, toiletries and hygiene and medis medical items, and um, some combs and toothbrushes. <coughs> All the finds have been recorded in a database. The finds are listed under the above mentioned classifications. For each find, a detailed description and a photograph is stored. The database will be used for educational work with young people. The huge number of finds gives us the possibility to learn more about the prisoners and the perpetrators. It is evident that objects embody a history and thus a memory. This memory is directly related to the meaning of the things during the time of use. Every age and every culture uses countless objects. However, these objects are not purely functional things that are used in a certain time and a distinctive cultural context for eating and drinking, reading or writing, or personal care. They have their own history and biographies and are connected to the biographies of their owners. Over space and time, the history and meaning of the objects, from production to use, repair, or other changes to waste products, but also their owner biog uh, biographies are inc inscribed in them. Therefore, it is important to consider the contents and the aspects of life in which the objects were used. 
Artifacts have a great consistency, a life of their own. Through transfers, they can get into a other cultural contexts. The things which we surround ourselves are shaped by general and social structures and conventions, cultural values and personal preferences. They can be symbols for structures that we can see easily, but also for structures that are not visible at first. So we can distinguish several levels. First, the importance of the objects for the different owners during the times of use, and secondly, the importance in an historical perspective that characterize the structures of the system. Transformations of the objects, meaning that result from passing it on and therefore changing its social status, have to be considered as well. This also applies to finds from the, from the, uh, from the former concentration camps. Often, archaeology restricted itself to analysis of the meaning of prestigious objects and the status symbols for all objects <coughs> from sacred contracts at these are considered as symbols of power in social elites. In terms of a contextual analysis, usually less attention is paid to everyday things. The artifacts from the concentration, uh, from excavations reveal a deep insight into the life of concentration camps. Whether it is the building of the SS, including the camp walls and the barbed wire, or the barracks of the prisoners or the crematoria, whether they are the eating and drinking vessels of the guards and the guarded and all other finds, all these objects carry the history in them and therefore become symbols of the structures and events of terror for us today. <coughs> Sometimes we discover finds from the prisoners that uh, preserve their powerlessness, oppression and humili humiliation, but possibly uh, also they say self-assertion. But there are also many objects that are need to be connected with the perpetrators and therefore have to be addressed as objects of power. I would like to show you some examples. The camp of Mauthausen is located on the top of the hill. The outer walls are were built by large <coughs> square stone blocks. Imposed are the watchtowers. This makes the camp look like a stronghold or a fortress. When arriving from the valley, this impression is even more intensified when looking at the high walls from the bottom. Also, the prisoners had this impression as in the memories of the contemporary witnesses, the term fortress occurs. So the Nazis concentration camp can be certainly declared as materialization of power. A special insight into the significance of the object that revealed by <coughs> engravings and ornaments on different objects and decorations that are not primarily functional in meaning, but show a little bit of individuality for instance, a small wooden heart, a star cut from an um, aluminium sheet, or engravings of bouquets, sailing ships, and city views. These finds represent a minimal rest of hope, strength, and a will to survive, which the prisoners probably might have felt when looking um, at these things. A lot of artifacts can be personalized and sometimes even addressed as belonging to particular prisoners. Especially imp uh, improvised objects often made of uh, ordinary material can be linked to the internees where as objects of high quality material are uh, possessions of the offenders. A good example is a tableware and a cutlery. There's tableware marked with labels of uh, porcelain manufactories that show from where the camp's administration received the porcelain for the dining facilities and the officers' mess. Additional stamps showing labels like SS Reich um, and the swastika uh, clearly reflect the relation to the Nazi regime. The high-quality porcelain is accompanied by cutlery made of high-grade steel or even precious, 
metal and sometimes engraved with initials which easily link them to the offenders, like this one here. <coughs> In contrast um, to these objects uh, stand the dishes and the cutlery of the prisoners. Cutlery from the large garbage pit from the edge of the camp triangle of Sachsenhausen totally varies in quantity uh, and material. There are 16 preserved knives or fragrance from knives. 12 of them are made of high-grade steel, one of iron, two of aluminium, and one of plastic. You can see the plastic one in the button. One example of high-grade steel, possibly silvered, bears the entwined initial H and O. Two of the objects do not fit into the ensemble. One knife um, of aluminium on the left-hand side, which seemed to be made by the prisoners out of a handle of another artifact, and the other one is the plastic um, knife uh, which had a corked blade. Forks are very rare in general. On the other hand, spoons appear quite often. Around 90 examples have been recorded. Comparisons to the material show the relations to the knives and the forks. Around 20 spoons, teaspoons as well as tablespoons are made of high-grade steel. This proportion corresponds with the one of the knives. On the contrary, there are um, 59 spoons made of aluminium and three of plastic, and they have almost no comparable equivalence. The prisoners' strategies for survival become apparent when looking closer at the cutlery that seems to be self-made by the internees for sometimes recycled materials. Almost all knives that can be linked to the prisoners are made by the victims themselves. Also, a spoon formed of a fragmented handle as well as another one made of high-grade steel are self-made. The used materials show the differing access of, of offenders and victims to cutlery. So to come to a final conclusion, it has to be noted that archaeological heritage intensively incorporates contemporary historical archaeologists in research going on in the monuments and the memorial sites of the Nazi periods. In Germany and Austria, the offices of preservation and of monuments recognize the importance of those places and treat them with the equal attention as sites from older periods. At the memorial site, interdisciplinary research with other historical and museological disciplines take place. Many, many valuable insights into the structures of the camp, the crimes, and the everyday life are obtained by archaeological um, archaeology and can reveal many new facets of the crime scenes. With the neighboring disciplines, these studies help to analyze uh, the conception of history of the camp and to present the results in the memorial. We also can tell some other stories uh, with the material culture. At the Leubel camp, one of the subcamp of um, uh, Mauthausen, we found this aluminum lid. You can see the characters Enfiture here, Rack here, and five francs here. And uh, first I have to mention that we know that um, in the Leubel subcamp there were mostly French prisoners. So we can ask, the vic so we asked the victims association in France whether they had an idea what Rack could mean. So far it was only obvious that the objects had something to do with confiture. We got the answer from France. There was a French uh, company called Vitrac, um, which produced jams and which is still existing today. Here you can see an old poster on the company with the corresponding char uh, characters. So this lit 
uh, covered a uh, can of jam, and it, back then it cost um, five francs. So I think the material culture, the buildings, the barbed wire, the tableware, the nails, and all other things we find, the inscriptions and the paintings show us today the different aspects of the camp, the victims, and the perpetrators. This new insight helped us and our children to remember, to commemorate, and to learn about the crimes and the war as a catastrophe of the 20th century. But they also point to single individuals, humans with names, women, men, children, victims, and perpetrators, their fight to survive, their fight for self-assertion, the crimes. Also interesting in the interplay of art archaeological heritage offices and uh, remembrance. Traditionally, memorials are places where national heritage, individual and collective traditions, a glorious history and identity becomes manifested. Such places of memory generally have a positive connotation and a meaning in the collective memory. Cultural places become places of collective memory as soon as they are ascribed symbolic power of events in the recent or distant past. They are preferred places for the erections of monuments that should pass on the mem memory and the remembrance of people or events thus become realms uh, of memory like uh, Lieu de Memoir after Pierre Noir. Former concentration camps or other places of Nazi terror in, on German territory do not fulfill this positive connotation. They are rather seen as evil places or memorials against will, as I said at the beginning. However, in Germany and in Austria, these places are today memorials and monuments. These places shall serve for the commemoration of the victims and as places where young people, tourists, and interested people can inform themselves about national socialism. But it also has to be stressed that these places play a different role in the memory of the people who survived and their relatives as for young people or tourists. Thank you very much. <laughs> Very much. I have to thank you for invitation to come here to Barcelona, a wonderful city and a really good conference. And I come from Brandenburg, which is very, very close to Berlin, as you will see soon. Uh, and my office is in charge of archaeological sites as well as of other monuments, historic gardens, castles, town walls, or whatever. So the excavations and documentation work is done by loads of, of, of people. Um, and I have to give my special thanks to Matthias Ankowiak, Anja Grote, Eberhard Völker, Johannes Weishaupt, uh, who did most of the excavations in uh, Brandenburg concentration camps. Where is this state of Brandenburg? You see it's around Berlin in the very east of Germany. Now it's, there are 
about 30,000 square kilometers and 30,000 archaeological monuments. And because it's so close to Berlin, it's yeah, in the center of Ebel. It's uh, very close to the Reichskanzlei, the Hitler's own office, and uh, the Reichssicherheitshauptamt. Uh, I can't translate into Spain, though it's, it's the center of the SS. And you have seen this map before. Uh, in Germany and Austria, you usually have normal concentration camps, and in Poland and uh, Belarus, you have the camps for extinction. A normal concentration camp is not uh, created to kill everybody. If it happens and there are shooting places and so on, it's, it's not a problem, but it's uh, not especially for killing. So, and uh, Claudia published a few years ago this, this map, and you see three of the excavations uh, in concentration camps at that time had uh, been in Brandenburg. Uh, but we are not only excavating in this improper concentration camps, but we have to excavate uh, also in other campsites of differing in character. You have heard in Sachsenhausen, the camp was used after 1945 by the Soviet uh, NKVD, later known as KGB, and they imprisoned Nazis, not Nazis, <coughs> it was, uh, they reused it and there were other sites like that in, in, in Ketchendorf, it's an NKVD camp. And of course, also normal prisoners of war camps are quite important. Uh, Stalag in, in Eisenhüttenstadt, because uh, prisoners weren't uh, yeah, treated well either, especially when they came from Eastern Europe. So. Over the years, lots of uh, excavation and documentation work had to be done. <coughs> we are not actually doing a research work with a scientific goal. We are excavating when there is some building work going on, a road or uh, some investors, or as you have seen in Sachsenhausen, when this educational monument is yeah, reorganized after 50 years. <coughs> so, so again here, uh, Sachsenhausen, because it's yeah, it's an ideal, an ideal plan of a uh, concentration camp. You see this triangle here, and the idea, as Claudia said, is the total control of the prisoners. Here, the plan of the barracks, and here is a tower with a machine gun, and you can fire in every direction. Yeah? One or two brave and good German men can keep hold of thousands of prisoners. Yeah? For those who like Lord of the Rings, the eye of Mordor is always watching you. But it's not only this, this camp, the center of this camp, there is um, here the so-called T building, admi administration building. Here are the barracks for the SS. Here is the C, the Z station for extinction cremation. And then there is, there are industrial estates because they had to work. Had to, uh, there was slavery work to be done, and uh, it, yeah, it was growing over the years. In the end, the SS was quite a strong economic structure as well as uh, a military and political structure. And all of that more or less belongs to the historical site of the concentration camp. But it's not all, not every part is part of the monument, of the education monument. It's concentrated here. But when there is a change going on, we try to do the documentation and um, the excavation because that's a plan. 
And as you know, from modern buildings, plans, and the really existing uh, buildings differ quite a lot. So here again, the camp and the barracks and station set. And here this industrial estate. Here again, aerial photography, and you see one or two men in this tower can control everything. So, and those were the places where the excavation were, were carried out. Not we decided where to excavate, but there was a plan how to show how this concentration camp worked for this political education. And uh, there was a big discussion going on because in 1961, as Claudia told you, it became a monument uh, in uh, GDR times. And there was a concept made by the so-called Buchenwald Kollektiv. Architects and artisans who had been imprisoned in Buchenwald in another concentration camp were, were doing the plan of this memorial. And the main point is a tower up there. They were just turning it around. Now they had won. They were overwhelming and uh, giving it a total new structure because they were overcoming this bad period. But it's very hard to explain people now how it has worked in 19... 38, 1941, when you have this new structure. But it was a quite uh, difficult discussion how it should, should be done. So, you have, you see the barracks, that's the ideal position, but it's not very good if you want to control this space from one tower, but uh, yeah, times get went on, and so they were building the quite different. So I'm doing this a bit faster because you have seen lots of pictures of Sachsenhausen anyway. So and when we had to establish the proper border of the camp because it wasn't known anymore. So here you see kind of a, a tower in the corner the wall itself, and now it's rebuilt as Gedenkstätte, it's written on it, memorial, yeah? And the wall now is open. You can go through the wall. And of course, very important is station Z, where the killing was going on with uh, crematory, uh, gas chamber, and shooting facility. You see the crematory over there and to preserve the crematory in the 60s there was a building made over it but it was rotten so it was a discussion how to do it new and of course because new buildings there's always some work to be done we had to do the documentation. And what was not known was this barrack. It was known uh, by Oral, as an, from oral sources, a barrack where the shooting, especially of uh, Russian prisoners of war, were going on. And they were shooting hundreds of them a day. The problem is not the killing, the problem is to get rid of the bodies. And uh, so the cremation, yeah, it, it was the crematory was working and working, but it you could kill always faster than you can cremate. So, and now you see the position of this killing barrack in museum. So, you have seen this already, this pan for the cremation remains and ash brushed out of the crematory and then put into pits. The teeth in the brick pavement here, it's a, it's a road. Mm. 
So it's building work going on. It's now the new housing of the crematory. Yeah, it's it's modern. So that was Sachsenhausen, and to every main camp there were loads of subcamps or satellite camps, because uh, the prisoners had to work and were brought to different areas. The next is place I'm talking about is Jamlitz. Jamlitz is a proper name, uh, but in the written source it's called Liberose. It's the closest little town. And uh, there is a story in Jamlitz. It was a satellite camp from Sachsenhausen from 1943 until spring 1945. And at Sachsenhausen it was an NKVD camp from 1945 to 1947. And now it's just a yeah, residential neighborhood with houses and gardens. Uh, and there is a special story due to eyewitness. Uh, and it's the 2nd and 3rd of February 1945. The SS guard uh, killed 2,300 prisoners. Uh, the SS, uh, they were drinking and shooting and, and killing them, especially ill and exhausted uh, prisoners. They couldn't move them to another camp because the uh, uh, Soviet army came, came closer and closer and this killing was going on in the so-called Schonungsbaracken, uh, uh, barracks for recovering. Yeah? And uh, then the eyewitness said they were hastily buried uh, in mass graves. In the 1970s, about uh, 650 or something like that uh, uh, of bodies were found at another place, so s still 700, uh, around about 700 were missing. And there was, is, was still one SS man alive, uh, and so the police asked us to do excavations to find the victims and hints to prove the case, because it might have been possible to um, to sentence him. So there was no building going on; it was in research work doing done for the police. And um, we knew from the from the plan of the uh, camp that there was in the most northwestern uh, area was this uh, area of the Schonungsbaracken. And um, so we were looking for the barracks and especially for a mass grave. So we cut trenches all over the place, used uh, metal detectors and uh, excavated here these uh, pipes from drainage. And so we were able to establish a plan. The green squares show you where the barracks were. You see the hours and hours, you see the stra uh, uh, drainage, and you see the modern buildings, modern, modern housing. And uh, we could find everything. We could find the barracks. We found uh, ammunition for a machine gun. We found <laughs> bottles from the drinking. We found ampulle, and so on, so on. And we found a big pit, and we thought it might be the grave. And um, especially Anja Grote, who did the excavation, she was briefed by an rabbi how to deal when uh, any human bodies are found. We would have to stop excavation. But in this pit, there was no body. Uh, so the eyewitness seemed to be not totally correct. He probably saw a killing and uh, saw them digging a 
pit, but didn't see actually that the dead bodies were put in this pit. There's somewhere, we don't know where, where they are. So um, that's always a problem, of course, with, with eyewitness. There are not totally correct, or if they end in, 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 in one point. For uh, yeah, to sentence somebody, it has to be really quite correct. And uh, the, the prisoners were brought from one camp to another, and they were not taught now you are going to this camp and so on and so on. So and it's mixed, it, it gets mixed up in, in memory. But we are sure there are some hundred more dead persons somewhere at the site. So now we are coming from Jamlitz to Rateno. So here it was a criminal investigation. Here it was to rebuild or re-establish an educational memorial site, and in Ratino it's quite different. Uh, in Ratino we had a satellite or subcamp you see in the aerial photography. It's zoomed here, you see the barracks, and then you see this crisscross trenches. It's for shelter if there's an uh, aerial uh, attack. And you see here this Railroad and the close uh, city of Fratino. And now you see the railroad. It's uh, a business estate, industrial buildings, and so on. And uh, before another one is built here, we are doing the excavation. Here it's done by, by Eberhard Völker. And you see uh, the pavement of the barracks and the, the housing quite close, the modern housing quite close. So normal uh, barracks for the, um, for the guards. And again, very important, those finds with names on them, self-made knives. And all those camps uh, are quite different, and the prisoners or the sometimes the inhabitants of camps are quite different. It, the war was going on and going on, and the German army needed millions of soldiers, but there had, was a lot of work to be done at home, and the work had to be done, of course, by German women and older men, by foreign contract workers, Volunteers, men and women from France, from the Netherlands, Belgium, wherever, from foreign contract workers pressed. Yeah. If you're not coming to work in the Reich, it will be bad for your family. So come. Uh, foreign compulsory workers, prisoners of war, from the Western countries, prisoners of war from Eastern Europe, especially from the Red Army, and Kansat prisoners. And there is a degree of suppression. And there is a degree of provision going the other way around. Of course, if there is lack of food, the Germans would get it first, and the Kansat prisoner would get it last. So, in these groups, there are also is a hierarchy, even in these groups. So, and to show how this can be seen on a on a single site, I'll bring you to Klein Machno. It's very close to the Berlin border, and Klein Machno was an industrial estate. You see here from this aerial photography all the factory buildings, and in this these factories they had work to be done. And so there is a workers' yeah, housing estate, let's call it, uh, in the east of it. And there we found, of course, a lot of finds which enables us to tell who was there, who was working there. So you see uh, French names uh, from the uniform knob 
from France, from Belgium, uh, applications, also French. And we found canteens from the Red Army. And uh, we are, had to excavate there because there's still an industrial estate and it's growing. And it, not every place in Brandenburg can be preserved because there are loads of those places. And as archaeologists like to do, they are excavating rubbish pits because they are always full of finds. And here you see the wash house of the camp. You see barrack in the front. The guard was living in the back uh, part. Uh, was a prisoner's area. And we found outdoor place for cooking. Not very comfortable. And we see that different groups were living here. We had an area for German workers. We had an area for foreign workers from Western Europe. There were barracks with cooking place, kitchens, and washing, and so it was quite fine. Less fine, it was here where the, especially the uh, Russian soldiers were living. They had to cook outside. There was a latrine outside. Uh, the barracks were not so good. And uh, the worst place was for KZ prisoners. They had to live in the cellar of the uh, uh, factory. And also from this area, from the finds, we know that there were uh, KZ prisoners. So on one side, you can have everything. And it's important to, to understand how it worked. And even without written sources, we could detect with archaeological work that people from different areas were treated different. So it's, uh, this ra racist attitude can be found without written sources. So, and we show a bit of it in my museum. That's a room concerning the modern times. The archaeological museum starts about 50,000 years ago. And in on about 2,500 square meters, you can see wonderful finds, and you at the end see can see finds from the camps. It's a closer view, and we divided the showcases. There is a bright side. On the bright side, of course, there are the objects related to the offenders. Yeah, it's blank steel here. We have these dishes. You saw this SS Reich, and uh, you have bottles of wine, you know, of course, helmets. You have this um, ceramic isolators for the barbed wire, and you have these windows looking to the other side. And the other side, it's the dark side, objects related to the victims. You have this pipes and teeth brush and knobs and uh, cross, ampulle, this um, registration marks. And of course, some objects are related to both sides. Those are parts from uh, airplanes who had to be produced by uh, the victims. And of course, we show how the documentation is done in detail. And uh, very important is a media point for more detailed information, because in that museum, we can't do the same amount of uh, educational work as it is done in the memorial site in Sachsenhausen. Uh, but we give a hint to that, and in this media station, you get quite a lot of information on all these excavations, and you can click in and get down and down and down, more information, more information, more information. So a, sh a, sh uh, a school class can have one one morning, 
uh, in the museum only dealing with campsite archaeology. Um, but the museum and a few finds is one thing, and uh, the camps outside is another thing, and the third thing you have seen is loads of find. I was very happy that uh, Claudia jumped in with her students to to look what is in this big garbage pit. Yeah, the, the soil was brought out and put aside, but th there was not enough money to do it properly, to excavate it. And you have seen a huge amount of finds, tons of iron. And normally, as archaeologists, we do some conservation work. Yeah? If it is a Roman find, or medieval, or Iron Age. But you, it's such a huge amount, and it's very hard to deal with aluminium. Nobody knows really how to do the conservation work. So it's stored now in, in Sachsenhausen, and we will see how it is uh, going on. And uh, we will do, I'm sure, more excavations on these sites, on uh, prisoners of war camps as well. And if you want to get more information about us, there are, I hope you can read it uh, to uh, internet address. It's too uh, faint. So that was just an overview. Uh, we are normally, in a year we have about 800 excavations in, uh, in Brandenburg. And uh, so www.b B L D A M. It's 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 short it's short for that. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> so. So, in a year we are doing more or less 800 excavations and at least two or so are concerning with campsite archaeology, in average. So if you want to do more investigations on that time, on the topic, you're always welcome to come. You can do a PhD in Vienna. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs>